Can you just adjust my name for me, please? Oh my gosh, it did it again. Okay, hold on a sec. There we go, perfect. That's so strange, like after you left and then when you came back, you, you'd think it would have kept the change, but I guess not, but it's okay now. All right, so we've got, I'm seeing we have um, 17 participants, wow. Okay, so that's seven panelists and we've got 11 attendees, people are coming in. Hello everyone, good to see you, good to see your names on the sidebar at least, even though we can't actually see you. Panelists, I'm not sure what you can see on your end, but I think if you click on participants at the bottom, it'll show you, like it'll open up um, a little bar on the side to show you how many people are in there, just in case you're curious. Oh, cool. Yeah, so welcome everyone. And um, we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes before we actually begin, just to allow people some time to, to join the webinar because we have quite a few people registered for tonight. Um, yeah, so just um, as a matter of course, uh, you're all, just because this is in a webinar format, you won't be able to use your, your microphones to speak, um, but the panelists will. They're the only ones who, who have that, that capability. But um, panelists, unless it is uh, your turn to speak, and I'll be doing this as well, I uh, request that you mute your mic just so that we don't get any accidental background noise or anything like that. Um, yeah, so just being mindful of that. And then of course, remembering to turn it back on when it is your turn to speak. Um, but yeah, so since the event hasn't, I noticed everyone muted themselves, but it's okay, like for now it hasn't actually started. So you can unmute yourselves if you want. We can have some, some banter while we're waiting for another minute. We can have banter for another minute and then I'll start the actual event because we have quite a few presenters tonight. And um, I've noticed that people always have a lot of really great insightful questions that they aim not necessarily just at one person but that like a bunch of people they want a bunch of people to answer them so yeah we want to give um, as much time as we can for everyone to present and then for the Q&A period afterwards um, and once you know we uh, I'm going to wait like another minute and then I'm going to explain how it works um, in terms of like the format of the event and then hopefully people will kind of just, if they come in late, hopefully they'll just sort of catch on and realize how it goes. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm used to meetings more so than webinars though, because meetings like people will come in and they'll forget to mute their mics and you can hear them making themselves coffee and it's just kind of got like a homey feel to it. And now it's just so eerily silent. Um, that's okay though. So yeah, so since we're a few minutes in, um, obviously more people are probably going to be arriving as we go, but I'm just going to start the event now. So my name is Michaela. I'm the Digital Initiatives Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor, and I'm going to be your host slash moderator for tonight. We have six lovely panelists here with us tonight. Uh, they're all going to introduce themselves and present their, their works and their stories in due time. Uh, first, I'm just going to explain the format of the event. So each creator here has six minutes to present on their work um, or on the, the story of how they came to be a jewelry maker. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to cut people off right at six minutes, uh, you know, like maybe a few seconds extra, you know, you might get in. But uh, for the most part, I have to be a little bit rude about it and just like firmly cut you off. I'm going to have everyone on a timer. Um, but if there's anything that you don't get the chance to mention over the course of your presentation that you do want to talk about, um, remember that someone might very well ask you, uh, you know, to continue what you were saying earlier as a part of the Q&A period. So there, there might be a chance for you to speak a little bit more on that afterwards. Um, I would love it if everyone would ask questions, uh, type their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom bar on Zoom as opposed to doing it in the chat because questions get lost so, so easily in the chat. Um, I don't know if I got all around to all of the questions that were typed into the chat last time, um, just because it was so hectic with all these other like encouraging positive comments about how awesome everyone was and just like full of compliments for the creators. So um, yeah, it would make it easier for everyone if you could keep your uh, questions to the Q&A box and I'll be moderating the questions. So I'm going to be the one 
asking them to the panelists and then the panelists will respond. So I'll go through them one by one as best I can. Um, what I'm gonna do is make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask a question if they want to. So uh, if you ask a question before somebody else, but you've already asked a question, I will get to you. Like I promise if I can, I will get to you, but I'm just gonna make it a priority to have uh, each new person have their question answered first. And then if we have time for second questions later on, we'll get to those. Um, so yeah, that being said, in terms of time, we may uh, you know, go a little bit over. The creators who are here today are by no means obligated to stay any later than eight o'clock because that's what the uh, presentations and Q&A period are supposed to be until just eight o'clock. That being said, they are more than welcome to stay if they want to continue to talk and answer questions. So um, it, it's really up to each individual creators. Um, some of them had to leave uh, kind of like right at the dot last time. Some of them had to um, or, or didn't have to. Some of them rather uh, stayed the entire time and made it like a, a really they really made an evening of it. So to each creator's preference. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm not leaving out anything in terms of housekeeping. Oh, yes, this is being live streamed to Facebook, as I already told our panelists, but um, no one can see your face because it's a webinar. So don't worry about that. Uh, it's just that a lot of people do like to tune in live. Um, yeah, and, and as a matter of fact, I'm trying to uh, make that happen right now. And for some reason, it doesn't think that I'm that I'm live, but I'll fix that in a second. Um, yes, okay. So, um, but before we continue the event, uh, there's something very important that needs to be done. I'm going to read the art gallery's land acknowledgement. Uh, and this will apply to, to most of, I'm not sure where everyone's tuning in from, but this will apply to uh, certainly all Windsor residents as well. So if we could all just um, listen to this carefully and let the meaning truly sink in rather than um, you know, tuning it out like you would with the O Canada when you were in grade school. This is um, a very important um, document that needs to be uh, acknowledged and understood. So the art gallery's uh, land acknowledgement goes like this. It is for the, it's tailored for the COVID-19 era too. So while this conversation and recording is happening digitally today, I want to acknowledge that I am physically situated on Anishinaabe territory, the territory, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. We want to state our respect of the, of the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. So thank you all for listening. Um, I'm going to hand it over to our creators now while I figure out how to make this actually go live on Facebook since um, I'm running into technical difficulties on that end. Um, I'm also going to, um, oh, it, it, the whole thing has been screen recording the entire time anyway, so that's fine. But um, yeah, we can post the full recording later to YouTube and we'll live stream as soon as I figure out how to do that. But we are going to begin with Mona Sullivan today. Um, Mona Sullivan is our first creator. And so uh, I'm gonna start the timer now and Mona, without further ado, please take it away. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Michaela, for this opportunity. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I thought perhaps I'd show some pictures of my work while I talk. So please bear with me while I get that set up. Oh, there it goes, okay. Um, Tonight, I'm focusing on my journey into jewelry making. Uh, you'll be able to understand more of what I do by looking at the scrolling pictures. I've always, always worked with my hands, but my jewelry making journey began about 15 years ago. In 2006, I took a lamp work bead making course at Essex Stained Glass in the town of Essex. And after this one class, I ended up buying everything that was needed to set up my own studio at home and started making beads. To make glass beads, you use a torch to melt glass rods onto a mandrel. The mandrel has been dipped in a bead release so the bead can come off the mandrel when finished. The bead is formed by gravity, always turning to make it round and adding different colors, dots, etc., until you get the desired effect. It really, it's not as easy as it sounds. 
Uh, just making a bead round takes time to master, but once that's done, you're on your way. Once satisfied with the design of your bead, it's put into a kiln at 950 degrees. You continue to make beads and adding them to the kiln until you're finished for the day. And then you set the kiln's program to start the cooling cycle, which takes about eight hours to cool down slowly, which is necessary for the integrity of the beads. After making beads for a time, I joined a, a glass guild in Detroit, the Southeast Michigan Glass Bead Makers Guild, or Glass Act for short. As a beginner, all my questions were answered by members in the guild who had experience and it was wonderful to belong to a group of like-minded people who enjoyed bead making as much as I did. Through the guild, I've had the opportunity of taking classes on bead making from teachers all over the world and have made many wonderful friends. I started online, my online Etsy shop after uh, a while to sell my beads to other jewelry makers and from there started to make jewelry myself. It was just a natural progression. Soon after that, I joined the Great Lakes Bead Workers Guild. It's one of the largest bead guilds in North America. They typically bring in four to five teachers throughout the year from all over. They not only bring in beading teachers, but teachers in many other mediums, including metalworking, wire weaving, kumihimo, bead embroidery, and polymer clay, to name a few. So over the years, through taking classes, my studio has also, has also grown to include uh, metal smithing tools, many, many beads and findings, many, many gauges of wire, and many, many pounds and colors of polymer clay. Polymer clay is one of the most versatile mediums I've ever worked with. And it's the only one since I've started glass bead making that has taken me off the torch for a period of time. Until I found polymer clay, I made glass beads on the torch every day. So of course, I joined the Metro Detroit Polymer Art Guild after uh, a few years ago after trying to resist the urge to join yet another group. This guild also brings in teachers to learn from and they also have a yearly retreat where over 40 polymer enthusiasts such as myself come together for a long weekend. They have a teacher come in to show us new techniques, but mainly we learn a lot from each other. Uh, actually, my daughter Jane and I traveled to Prague in October 2019 to take classes with three different teachers in polymer clay. It was a fabulous experience and we were able to combine our classes with a trip to Jablonek to visit the Czech glass bead factories and also to explore the wonderful city of Prague. And so glad we did it as it was the last trip we've been on since COVID hit soon after. I also participate in a few artisan shows in the area. Art in the Park, which I've been in for the past eight years, Art by the River in Amherstburg, and Art in the Boulevard in Erio. Uh, I also did the Love Local shows in years gone by at the Walkerville Brewery and some Etsy shows in the past few years. And apart from participating in shows, I also enjoy going as a customer because they're full of inspiration. For now, I sell my lampwork beads, polymer components, and jewelry online on Etsy and on Facebook auctions. My jewelry has really evolved over the years because of all the classes and techniques I've learned. My favorite thing to do is just create components in wire, glass, paper, or beading. And then when I'm inspired to make jewelry, I have many different elements to draw from. I like the interest that's brought to a piece of jewelry by using multiple mediums, and they're my favorite type of jewelry to make. My work is always evolving and my intent is to create artisan jewelry that has been entirely made with my hands from the beads to the clasp. I hope you've enjoyed the slideshow. It should give you an idea of the types of jewelry I make. And as you can see, I'm all over the map. <laughs> I tend to get in a groove and make a few variations of one type and then I get bored and go to another medium. Thanks for the opportunity to show you my work and I hope it's brought you some inspiration. You can find me on Etsy uh, under Mona's Lampwork. Uh, Instagram is also Mona's Lampwork and on Facebook. Thanks so much. Excellent, Mona. Thank you for the great presentation. And you came in under the six minute mark. So that's great. Um, I am going to be uh, also, if, if all of the creators are okay with it, I'm going to be posting um, some of their links like social media or their websites if they have them in the chat so that, uh, you know, the audience can click and go on ahead. So I'll be doing that as they're presenting. All right. And now we have Laura. It's Laura's turn. Hi, everybody. 
Um, my name is Laura Kalati, and I actually prepared a video to show you. Um, so I will just go ahead and share that. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Great, here we go. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Laura Kalati and I am the embroidery artist behind Fearfully Made. So um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a backstory behind where this business all came from and how it was born. So basically, I'm gonna try and do this as quickly as possible. It's a long story. Um, so my last pregnancy with my second baby, um, I struggled a lot with postpartum depression. Um, it was pretty deep and pretty dark. And um, I, I realized at some point that I had neglected to take care of myself. Um, I, and I'm talking like, like eating and, and showering and sleeping, like basic, basic human needs. Um, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to take some time for myself and I'm going to get back to embroidery um, and do things for me to, to nourish my, my soul back to health. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to stay close to God and help and, and lean on God to help me through this. So that's where the name Fearfully Made came from. Um, it's Psalm in the Bible, uh, 13914. And um, yeah. So in the beginning, it was it was about nourishing my soul back to health. But as I began embroidering and decided to sell things to people, it became about everybody else, especially when I started offering custom pendants for people. Um, I would ask them how I can pray for them while I embroider their pendants. And oftentimes they were very sentimental pieces, reminding them of really important um, moments in their life. So the process was very intimate, very personal, very quickly with my clients um, and incredibly fulfilling for me, which is when I realized that fully getting out of depression was more about serving others than serving yourself and, and wondering why am I here? Why am I doing this? How can I get, how can I help myself? You know, what do I need? It was more about helping others and serving others. So, um, and that's where we are today. So Fearfully Need has become about others and helping others along the journey and um, spreading happiness and joy and embracing who we are uh, because we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, I'm going to go into um, the process a little bit and show you a little bit of the behind the scenes, uh, how we get to the finished product. So here we go.
end of process um, from start to finish. I will be having another shop on April 17th at bakerymove.ca. Um, so tune in for that. And um, yeah, every shop that we have, we donate to women's charities. Um, and I uh, have big plans in the future to uh, benefit the community and um, grow in the future. So thank you for sticking with me through that video, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Um, I do have to cut you off right now because it's the six minute mark, but thank you for that video. That was excellent as well. We are off to an amazing start tonight. Everyone has made such cool jewelry and I'm, I'm so excited for you to be sharing it with all these people, um, not just the people who are here in attendance, but live on Facebook as well. Hundreds of people are going to see it. Um, all right, so now we are on to our next panelist, Cynthia Freschetti. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored to be presenting alongside these talented creators and I really appreciate those of you who are tuning in from home. Just gonna share my screen here. Um, all right. Cynthia, could you speak up a little bit more, please? Oh, sorry, can you guys hear me now? That's a bit better, yeah. Okay, um, so my name's Cynthia and I'm an interdisciplinary artist, which basically means I do a little bit of everything but I tend to focus within the realms of sculpture and jewelry. So with my sculptural work, I focus on assemblage, which is basically an artwork that combines multiple objects. And I've been collecting objects for as long as I can remember, partly because I'm so fascinated by their beauty, but also because of their origins, you know, taking into consideration how they somehow made their way to me within the grand scheme of things. And so when I create these pieces, I'm kind of in this meditative state where I have all my collected objects across the table and I'm just reacting to them and playing with them and organizing them in a way until an artwork feels complete. And I had difficulty tapping into that, med into that meditative state when I first started um, jewelry until I created this ring. Um, at my school, we have these bins in the studio of scrap metals for students um, to throw their scraps into. And I'm always rummaging through because I love finding pieces that might otherwise be deemed flawed. And so I found this thick sheet of metal and I filed the sides down so it would be smooth. And then um, I hammered it around on anvils and vices until it kind of created this form. And I remember being so in tune as it was being created that it felt like the metal was just waiting to exist in this way. And that was really surreal for me because um, normally I'm just working with pre-existing objects. And with this, I was able to create an object. Um, so I continue to play around with these hollow forms, which is basically taking metal and hammering it around. And um, partly because it allows me to get into this flow state, but also because it resembles nature. And I feel that nature is the embodiment of that flow state. You know, um, in the natural world, things are constantly adapting to their environment so that they can thrive. Um, so I've also practiced with um, recreating nature. So this piece is a silver dollar plant necklace. If you look at the photo on the left, you can see some of the real leaves I snuck into it. And um, basically um, I wanted to try to find a way to emulate the translucence of the leaves. And so it required a lot of material exploration as you can see in this slide, just so that I could find that balance between working with materials intuitively as well as being able to get them to look the way that I wanted them to. So I kind of mean that like, if you look at this photo on the left, um, it's one of the branches or chains in the necklace. And I took two different thicknesses of wires and I allowed the solder to fill, like to spill over so that there would be a smooth transition so that it would emulate a branch. And I allowed the heat treatment to stay on there so that it would emulate the colors of a branch. Um, 
So yeah, basically the way I approach my work is that I create one of a kind pieces because it kind of, um, my hope is to invoke the same sense of love and curiosity in my work that I find when I find my objects. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna take you through, through a few pieces now. Um, these are some natural objects that I worked on um, sealing so that they would um, remain sturdy. The photos on the right are some avocado pits that I cut and then I quickly had to seal them before they would change colors. Um, then I've played with some crystals a lot. Um, here I'm kind of going back to my assemblage roots with combining crystals and found objects. Um, with this piece, I'm kind of focusing on allowing the wearer to feel that um, the crystal on their fingers so that they can feel that physical connection to nature, as well as make the metal surface kind of work cohesively with the stone, rather it just be a ring with a stone as the focal point so that it kind of emulates the sense of an object. And then I've also played around with creating objects that seem to be naturally occurring, even though they evidently aren't. Um, and then same with this, I've taken metal scraps that I've saved from casting processes and um, turned them into a ring. And then my most recent work, I've been practicing making my assemblage wearable. Um, so this is a necklace that I've made and it looks super heavy, but it's actually only 147 grams, which is like a handful of jelly beans. And again, I'm working on creating a full piece so that it seems like it's an object rather than just being like a focal point. You know, it's just, it's this thing that kind of embodies this interconnectivity within our universe. So yeah, thank you. I've included my socials here and yeah, feel free to check out my stuff. Thank you, Cynthia. Once again, it's the night is excellent. Everyone has been excellent. Um, I will include your, um, I didn't do your Etsy link yet, so I will include that as well in the chat next. Um, so thank you, Cynthia. Next, we have Kat Pasquatch, and you may go ahead whenever you are ready. Oh, you're muted, Kat, sorry. Yeah, so I was just clicking on the unmute button. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Kat Pasquatch. Uh, I'm the owner of Culture Shop Jewelry, and um, I didn't fully prepare uh, a lot of visuals tonight, but then I thought about what is it most important that I would want to share um, when we did our little bit of a practice run earlier. So I'm going to pull that up quickly. Um, oh, I need to move this. Uh, there we go. Okay, sorry. So my story um, about how I got started in jewelry making really um, starts with my grandmother and my mother. Um, they are both traditional craftswomen um, who earned income or supplemented their income with crafts. And so this is my grandmother, Katie Pasquatch, and has been a huge um, influence on my life. Um, and growing up, she has been um, a very well-regarded craftsperson, um, both when growing up, uh, we lived in Toronto. And then when she um, was older, she moved back home to our reserve, Moose Factory, Ontario. And so it was her and my mother, which I'm going to pull up in the next photo, um, my mother being on the right, um, that taught me beading at the age of five. So it was at five years old that I was first kind of introduced into crafting and art making and actually entrepreneurial things, because at that age, I was making simple uh, beaded necklaces and selling them um, at powwows and art festivals. So it was really exciting to, you know, put together a piece and make three bucks a pop. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm making $15 for candy, which was like a great, a great thing at the time. Um, I carried on with my beating, um, you know, into my youth. And it was as, my, as I kind of hit my teens and exploring other extracurricular activities that I kind of pulled away from it. Um, always still involved in my culture and you know the, the my community but it was actually at um, an arts festival in Ronsonsville in Toronto where I was exploring the vendors and I came across the um, jewelry makers and I found earrings and I'm a huge jewelry lover and I'm a big sucker for earrings and I bought a bunch of earrings my favorite pair of earrings that I bought um, I wore them all the time and I lost one one day and I was devastated I was like oh my gosh I have no idea how to find 
these, this maker again. I don't know what I'm going to do. And this was definitely like before the time where social media was an easy thing to find people. But I was like, but I do know a lot of bead stores. I know um, where I could potentially find the things to replace this earring. So I'm walking on Queen Street in Toronto, I'm walking into the bead shops. And it was like being flooded with all of these amazing memories of being with my family and growing up and always going to these bead shops. And so I actually found the exact beads that the maker had used and I was able to reproduce the one side of the earring. And that was it. I have, so I still have beads from that trip, that, that um, from those early trips, which were, uh, I don't even wanna say how long ago now, <laughs> but um, collecting beads and, and um, that the journey of jewelry making ever since then has been phenomenal. And so it wasn't long after that, that I was really getting back into the jewelry making. I was like, okay, I wanna give this a name. I wanna give it a go. And that was where Culture Shock Jewelry came in because so much of my upbringing had been about um, kind of cultural pieces and cultural beating, um, being immersed in, in powwows. Uh, but then, being older and then finally having this opportunity to branch out in my styles, I knew that I was going to be bringing in um, diverse influences, which is where culture shock came in. Um, the jewelry that I was making was always going to be different from the traditional beadwork at powwows. And then if I was looking at, you know, other art based festivals, I was always going to be a little bit different because my work always had like these traditional components to it. So there's a lot of people that have always asked me like culture shock, what, what is that about? And that's where it comes because I've never felt like I was gonna conform to one sort of um, approach with my jewelry making. And I think that that, um, that speaks, um, a lot of people respond to that. And I'm really excited because I get to share a lot about my culture, which I'm incredibly proud of. Um, my family is Cree. So this is in the picture of my mom, my grandmother and my sister, and they're all beaters. Um, I would say my grandmother's retired beater now. And then the baby in there is actually my niece who is seven now, who actually makes jewelry as well. And she is one of the best salespeople ever. So I'm so incredibly proud of her. Um, and it's so great how, um, how much of the art, um, artistic uh, talent in the family has carried on because she's been a big part of it and wants to learn. Um, so really proud of her. Uh, so this picture is a bit dated, but that's okay. Um, when um, I have about a minute left, but when I really started to get back in uh, back into beading, this was the first pair of earrings that I um, had made with beadwork, and it's actually a bit more of a traded, um, a newer style of beadwork that's coming out right now. I shouldn't say right now that has kind of like taken stage across Indigenous communities. I wanted to share that um, being. Uh, really proud of being able to hold on to um, my culture with my work. And uh, just a quick scan. Oh, of course the message pops up as I'm trying to show everybody. <laughs> um, but just a quick scan. Um, my work is not just jewelry, but a lot of traditional crafts as well. And so pouch making and moccasin making. <laughs> my alarm to tell me to stop talking guys, but anyway. That's everything that I have to say today. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kat, for sharing with us. That was a wonderful, wonderful story and glimpse at your work. And um, you totally, you didn't have to set an alarm for yourself, but oh, that's cute that you did. So um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing. And I've noticed that um, there are a couple questions in the Q&A already, and I am so sorry if I didn't mention this at the beginning of the event, I must just be so used to it, but um, yeah, the, the question and answer, um, instead of being like after each individual creator, it'll be at the very end after everyone has presented. So I, I apologize if I neglected to mention that earlier. Um, but yeah, that's the format. All right, so now it's Dina's turn. Whenever you're ready, Dina. Hi, everyone. Good evening. First of all, I just want to say I'm so incredibly honored to be here amongst um, all of you beautiful people. Um, I did not prepare a slideshow as I'm not the techiest of people, but I do have a couple of pieces that I want to share once I'm finished. So I'll begin my presentation. My name is Dee Shower. For those of you that don't know me, I became the owner of Divine Intentions on January 2017 for my dining room table after many years of hobby creating. I always say I was that teenager in the 90s weaving hemp bracelets and chokers and giving them away. 
My business is and always will be inspired by yoga, healing, meditation, mindfulness, and intention setting. Over the last four years, Divine Intentions has not only grown into my full-time job, but most importantly, a circle and community of powerful intention setting, meditating, praying souls. My vision and why expands beyond jewelry. I strongly believe that we all have the ability to come into alignment with our dream life. In order to do this, we must step into and remain in the vibration of our best selves, both spiritually, spiritually, physically, and mentally. My pieces are just the simple reminders when they are being worn. Last year when COVID hit, I had the strong calling from God to take my deep inner why for my business, which is helping others elevate and use it to help the community through the uncertain times. Using my pieces, uh, using my pieces as tools, I began teaching more yoga, intention setting, guided meditations online, along with launching a website, finally. I was blessed to have Divine Intentions take a tremendous growth in 2020. I will always look back and give it up to my lead with heart and soul, my heart and soul intuition mentality. My pieces are all created using high quality vibrational crystals. I use wire wrapping, stringing, or soldering techniques. So I'll show you guys just a few pieces of my bracelets here. I've got some wire wrapping. And that's a crescent moon. My well-known 108 meditation malas are made using a sacred traditional skill that was passed to me using only my hands and feet to knot between each of the stones 108 times. So that is all handmade, including the tassel. After each piece is ready to leave me, I bless it for the wearer by saying a little prayer for their well-being and journey through life. To view my creations, you can come visit me on Instagram at Divine Intentions or drop into my website at www.divineintentions.com. And I also have a Facebook page at Divine Intentions. Thank you all for allowing me to share my passion and the space to speak. Peace, love, and light to you all. Thank you, Dina. That was also wonderful. Everyone's been so amazing so far with their stories and their speeches and their, their work. Um, this is also like, this is all just really inspiring for me personally. I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but I'm sure that we all do. Um, and I have been dropping everyone's websites and social media links in the chat as well. Uh, so please do check them out. Uh, but without further ado, it is now Jade's turn. So Jade, whenever you're ready, go right ahead. Hi, I'm Jade, and I'm very grateful to be here tonight with all you guys, some wonderful people, obviously, that we've been listening to tonight. Um, I've always been very um, creative, I guess. It's an outlet that I've always had um, to express myself, and I never really, um, I guess, found the right one that uh, worked for me. I dabbled here and there. I would crochet, I would, which I still do, of course, but I would um, make t-shirts, paint, um, many things that I've done over the years. And it wasn't until I bought a cricket, actually. I owned a yoga studio with a couple of other people and I bought a cricket to um, make t-shirts with for our studio. And so I started because of my love of huge earrings. I've always loved big earrings. I used to go, same as Kat, I used to go to all the um, craft shows and I would walk around until I found the booths that had the nice big earrings that I could buy. And I often lost them as well. Um, but I would um, buy them every single time from someone and they always had to be very light. I don't like anything too heavy. So I would buy that and decided that um, I would try making the faux leather um, cutouts with my Cricut machine um, and uh, seeing if I could make some earrings for myself. And so I tried it and people started really loving them. And because we were closing our yoga studio at the time, I started to give away earrings and then people 
said to me, why don't you start looking into um, finding out how to go into markets with them? So I got on a page on um, Instagram, which originally was called actually Things Made by Jade and uh, did a market at a, rest a local restaurant. And people kept asking me about um, uh, the uh, essential oils and gemstone bracelets. So I started looking into it and researching it and finding a great, uh, like some places to buy the stones. And I started getting into that. I've always been very um, intuitive and um, like an empath. So energy has always been a big thing in my life. And the healing stones and different uh, healing properties of them really um, drew me in. So I started making the, um, the bracelets, the um, gemstone stretch bracelets, and it kind of went from there. So then I started doing the wrap ones where the gemstones were sewn into the wraps. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed doing that. But then after that, I discovered polymer clay. And I think the artist in me came out with the polymer clay where I could actually design it from beginning to end. So I really started researching it and getting into that. And it's kind of gone to that direction lately, but I have a few earrings here that I can hold up. So I have, let me see here for you guys. So I've been doing a lot of, um, sorry, I'm kind of shaking cause I'm shy, I'm shy. <laughs> but um, I've got the, uh, this is polymer clay with an embossed flower. I don't know, can you see that? I can't even see myself on the screen, so I don't know if you can see it or not. Um, closer to the camera. Oh, oh yeah, here, how's that? Perfect. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I've got some embossing ones that I've been doing, which have been popular and in different colors. Um, then I've got some, as you can see, they're all kind of long and dangly, but I've got these ones. I also do, um, studs which i've been doing a lot of with uh, flowers i love flowers and it's springy so i've been doing that and uh, here's another set that i have that one and i've gotten into necklaces as well so uh the long pendant necklaces which um have been pretty popular people like that they're very very light and so yeah it's kind of gone for there my company also started actually um, my name of my company is after my grand, two grandmothers. So Libby and Jean were both my grandma's names. They were a big influence in my life growing up and probably what started me in my artistic stuff. So yeah, that's kind of where, where it all came from. But, um, I love doing this stuff. Like I've, I've kind of feel like I found where I belong. So that's basically my story. All right. Thank you for sharing, Jade. Awesome. Everyone was so awesome. I, I am just in love with everyone's work and with everyone's presentations and stories. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and for sharing tonight. Um, so yeah, just a quick, uh, quick thing before we move on to the Q&A period here. Um, I just want to note that we uh, our partners for this event are the Rose City Etsy team. Uh, so they are local makers of all sorts, including jewelry makers and also urban art market, which is uh, also local. And once again, is comprised of jewelry makers among many other creators. So um, thank you to them for helping us to promote this event. And I'm just going to share their Facebook and Instagram links in the chat for everyone here. So check them out if you get a chance. All right. So now the Q&A period begins. Uh, all right. So Monique would like to know, Cynthia, what is your favorite medium to work with? And do you have a favorite piece that you've made? So that's kind of a, a two part question there. Um, I don't really think I have a favorite um, specific material to work with. For me, I like to work within the realms of sculpture because it's so versatile and I like that tactility. So I suppose that um, the materials I work most with tend to be metal because I find that there's a huge range and being able to create something that's durable that you can combine in unorthodox ways with other objects. And favorite piece that I've worked on? I don't think I have one. Like for me, like um, I kind of just focus on the processes. So I guess that the pieces that I do tend to like more are the pieces that I enjoyed creating more. So the sculptural piece I showed you was pretty fun to do. It took a while, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Thank you, Cynthia. And also, uh, my mistake, Monique was sending the question in on behalf of Michelle. So that wasn't Monique's question, that was Michelle's question. That was added afterwards to the Q&A. <laughs> um, we don't currently have any other questions in the Q&A. Perhaps people are taking some time to digest and to think of some questions. However, um, my mom actually sent a question through email because she wasn't sure how this worked exactly. Um, and it, it's aimed at everyone actually. So if you'll indulge me for just a second because, um, because we have time for that. Um, what, okay, so this is aimed at everyone uh, and you can go in whichever order you like, but what are your sources of inspiration? A very broad question um, and some of which you've already uh, touched upon in your, in your presentation, but if you want to go even further with it, now is your chance. Yes, Kat, you're, you're on. Oh, you're muted, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, you're like, you're on. I'm like, I'm not on because I can't <laughs> click the mute button. <laughs> I was just thinking, like, I'm looking at everybody, and Cynthia, I think, is the only person that I haven't met um, at a jewelry show, but I have everyone else's jewelry that's here, and so all of you are my inspiration, because I know that if it, all of us looked at a certain material, we would all have very different ideas on how to use it, and that's, like, the best part about jewelry making, and, like, when, when you're talking about, like, big earrings, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes, I went through such a phase of big earrings, but I look to a lot of other people. Um, as my inspiration because they put together co color combinations that I would never think of sometimes and the way that Laura uses embroidery like thread like I would have never thought to put jewelry like that I use embroidery thread a lot with like my my craft making but it's just it's just amazing the things that we can look at and all see different things so I see a lot of inspiration in my peers around me lovely Kat thank you thank you for that answer and that's that's a very good point too is um you know even after you've begun your career you continue to get inspiration from from your peers as well um okay who wants to answer that question next if if we have any um elaborations from the presentation oh okay I, I saw two hands go up at once okay we'll do we'll do Jade and then Cynthia and then Dina I think I saw so okay um, yeah, definitely from peers, but um, I'm, I know this is going to sound kind of funny, but I'm a massage therapist in my day job. And uh, I can, my brain does, never shuts off. It's constantly coming up with design in my head. And if I don't, can't obviously write it down at that point, but I, uh, if I see a color or whatever in the room, it's, it's constantly nonstop. I'll get inspiration when I'm driving down the street or doesn't matter there's it's always it's non-stop never shuts off in your head so I think it just comes from everywhere yeah I I understand that feeling personally too my my background is in creative writing even though I work at the gallery so um I definitely get where you're coming from there Jade uh Cynthia yeah you raised your hand next um yeah for me it's obviously my peers and the people that I'm surrounded by but I tend to look towards nature and um natural objects because I kind of think that it speaks to this larger idea of interconnectivity within our universe like if you see like all these different objects you know whether it be like a metal and a stone like they're able they have like different origins but they're able to come together in ways that you might not even be able to contemplate which I also believe is how the universe operates you know like everything's happening behind the scenes for ultimately the best and again, I find that the natural world kind of shows that. So whenever I'm collecting objects from nature, um, I just get all these ideas in my head on how to make them look kind of weird, but cohesive, so. That's awesome, Cynthia. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and there, there will be, we have a, a couple more questions in the chat that kind of relate to that a little bit more. So there will be branching off from that in a second, but um, we're going to ask, uh, Dina raised her hand as well. And then Laura, if you have anything to say after Dina, then we'll, we'll um, have you answer the question as well. So yeah, just as a reminder, the question everyone was, where do you get your inspirations from? Uh, and Dina, you're, you're muted, sorry. Thank you. Um, I get my inspiration from, I guess, the thing, I guess, intuition and the things that I'm going through in life that I can kind of look back at my progression through my creating and kind of see like what was going on in my life 
based on what I was creating. So, um, and I always say too that I owe oh, the stones always, um, always really give me some insight as to what, uh, what I'm going to create. And I can look at a stone and it actually tells me what to create. Um, I can, I always tell everyone what I'm creating, like I'll wrap a stone, but it's not me actually wrapping it. The stone will tell me how to wrap it because they're also different. That is super cool. Might we call you the stone whisperer? Is that, is that okay? Yes. Okay, cool. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Dina, the stone whisperer. Um, Laura, do you have anything that you would like to add? Um, honestly, I'm going to sound like an echo uh, from everyone else's um, answers. I, I do pull a lot of inspiration from other people's work um, in, in different kinds of ways, you know, like I'll see someone make something like, you know, your silver dollar necklaces, right? And I'll be like, oh, what if I embroidered something similar, you know, like I love silver dollar, I love everything in nature, different landscapes and stuff. But you could also pull inspiration just from your thread box or from like a nature walk or something that happened with your kids. Like it, it's like it's all over the place, all just all the time. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And yeah, it's, I think it's common for, for people within the same craft to have, um, you know, like similar inspiration sources as one another. So that's, you know, it's perfectly okay that we're hearing some similar answers here. And Mona, do you have anything that you would like to say to add on to your, your sources of inspiration? I, I usually take mine from um, color is my big inspiration and texture. And I can usually look in my, um, on my bench <laughs> and, and find something that, you know, that I've maybe had there for months and all of a sudden it'll, okay, I know what I'm going to do with that now. And it just, it just takes time to percolate and um, it either happens or it doesn't, you know, one of those things, but um, color is my biggest inspiration, I think. That's really cool. That's that's an answer we haven't heard yet. Color. Um, and that's I, I think that'll apply to a lot of other visual artists and a lot of other genres as well and not just um, jewelry. But that's really cool, Mona. Thank you. And um, I like that kind of no pressure approach that you take for yourself there. Like if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. No need to force it. That's really nice. Um, OK, so uh, our next question in the Q&A here. This one is um, from an anonymous individual. This is for Cynthia. Uh, this person is just wondering how you decide whether a found object is worth keeping and do you keep all the objects that you're drawn to? That's a great question. <laughs> I've actually never really given it much thought because usually like I'll just be walking and I'll see something on the side of the road and I'll be like oh that's so cool I have to have it and it's usually like objects like scrap pieces of metal that have like beautiful like patinas or corroded surfaces or interesting stones or like you know seashell barnacles and stuff and usually I'll just collect it because like it brings me some sense of like happiness and a feeling of connection to the universe and then I always know that I'll use it eventually in a project, but I never have any idea of when that will be or what it will be. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, we actually have another question in, uh, for you. I'm going in order in which these okay. were typed into the Q&A period. Sorry, I hope we're not like exhausting you. No, not at all. I could talk about my work all day. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, okay. Uh, so uh, Dagan, I believe that's how it's pronounced, says, I loved everybody's work tonight. Thank you for such a lovely evening. Cynthia, you talked about how, um, how you structure much of your work around the flow of nature and the processes that you create. Do you specific structures and pieces represent different flows to you? And then there's a, a second part to the question that's for everyone. But first, I'll let you uh, take that one. Let me know if you need me to repeat it. Okay, no, um, I just pulled it up here so I can read it. Oh, you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, for me, I find that a lot of my work tends to have this kind of like organic, like circular kind of flow that's also kind of like shoppy. And um, for me, I think that kind of is just like if you were to like look down on the universe on like everything that's 
ever existed, like people, objects, nature, and just look at it from an aerial point of view, that's kind of like the structure that ends up happening within my work. And for me, I think it's also kind of because of my process, like I have all these objects laid down in front of me and then I'm just like grabbing and like putting them next to each other and trying to find a way to make them fit in a way that makes sense visually. I don't know if that answered your question. But <laughs> Hopefully it did or else uh, they can ask a follow up and then if we get around to asking people, I mean, people who've already asked questions, if we get around to seconds for everyone, so to speak, then uh, yeah, but the second part of the, or the second part of the message that they sent was to everyone, what for, what do forums and exhibits like this offer to you or like these offer to you? So that's for everybody. Uh, and who would like to go first to answer that one? <laughs> I'll go. Okay, Mona. A <laughs> uh, chance to get out of my comfort zone. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not good at public speaking, so I kind of took this as a, an opportunity to um, grow a little bit. Um, and it's it's nice to be with uh, others who can relate and to just share our experiences. That's it. Thank you, Mona. That's very nice. Does anyone else have um, anything to add? Anything? Okay, Kat, yeah. Oh, Dina used the, or D, I'm so, when I saw, sorry, <laughs> I've always known D is D, and when I see Dina, it totally throws me off. The first time I heard somebody call her that, I was like, I don't know who that is. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> God, I love community. I love networking. Um, I spoke about that when I'm, and um, my, when I say community, there's a lot of intersection that happens because Often I'm talking about the indigenous community, but then there's like the handmade maker community in Windsor as well. And then there's the art community. And for me to just come out and talk for, when I got asked to talk for six minutes about jewelry making, I was like, yeah, no problem. I could do that. I could talk all night if you want me to. And so it's just a, an amazing chance to share. It's an amazing chance to share and do some storytelling. And that's really important to me. And so um, the benefit is just, um, being a part of something, a bigger thing, right? Because I am a big supporter of that community piece. So I enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Also a great answer. Everyone's got such great answers. There's no such thing as like a wrong answer to these, obviously, but they're they're also, you know, heartfelt and well thought out that um, I personally, I really appreciate them all. Um, yeah, so who, who wants to answer the question next? Um, and totally, it's it's totally okay. I'm not gonna like keep on, oh yeah, I see Dee's got her hand raised. I'm sorry, I, like the Dina thing, I didn't know that that was like a, I, you know what, I'm just gonna call you the Stone Whisperer. That's your new, that's your new name anyway. So the Stone Whisperer is next, um, but I, I will not um, force you to answer questions that are directed at everyone. So if you don't, you could just say, you know, like, or just like wave your hand or whatever if you don't have anything further to add from what everyone said. But anyway, sorry, D, go ahead, Stone Whisperer. I get formal on these Zoom things. I use my my legal name. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this offers me really, um, like Mona said, a chance to get out of my comfort zone. So tonight I thought, you know what, I got to get on my share screen, screen game um, to get a little bit more into the tech world. Um, and it's also nice to just be in the community um, with COVID and as social distancing still and all this stuff going on, I'll take every opportunity that I can to, um, to connect with people. Um, being here at home, working is sometimes can get a little bit monotonous. So I just love uh, getting out and talking to you guys and just connecting with the community. Thank you, Dee. Um, does does anyone else have? Um, I know we're we're encroaching on eight o'clock. So if anyone needs to leave now or um, you know has has prior commitments, please do not feel obligated to to stay any longer. Um, but of course, you are more than welcome to keep answering questions, keep the night going. It's totally up to you. Um, but yeah, uh, does anyone else have anything that they would like to add for um, for this question? No? Okay. Um, all right, so next question. Um, let's see here. 
All right, so we've got a couple more questions from Michelle, but Michelle has already asked a question. So we'll come back to Michelle again later. Um, we're gonna go to uh, new people. Okay, so anonymous attendee. Um, I don't know if this is the same anonymous attendee as before though. So we're just gonna read this in case it's a different person. So this is from Mona. You spoke of being a member of a few guilds. How did you find the different guilds and how does the process work? Oh gosh, it's been a long time. Um, I found out through the guilds just through word of mouth. Um, and then once I was in one guild, um, the other guilds came from there because there's so many members, you know, one will say, oh, you've got to, you know, join this guild and you should join this one. And, and like I said, I had, was already involved with two and the polymer guild came up and I said, no, I'm not doing anymore. And I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And then I, I succumbed and <laughs> I had to do the polymer guild in the end because I was really enjoying polymer. So um, it just, it was for me, it was just word of mouth uh, is how I found them. Um, just people telling me about them. And, uh, and then you just, uh, obviously it's easy to uh, Google where they're at and when they meet and get all the information and go, you know, they're all very, um, the ladies that I've uh, met in the guilds they're they always are so welcoming uh to new members and um yeah it's great thank you mona for that answer um we have uh, a question that i think is for everyone this one's from dan so uh oh yeah it says to anyone and it's a covid question um so will COVID and all the lockdowns, oh yeah, with COVID and all the lockdowns, do you find your jewelry making uh, helps you keep your mind busy to escape? Uh, have you seen sales go up or down with limited shopping in small stores? So a two part question there. Um, and anyone who wants to answer, I kind of like how our resident stone whisperer used the raise your hand function to show. So yeah, like if, if any one of you panelists want to do the raise your hand thing, then I'll, I'll call on you to, um, to answer next. Very efficient. Okay, Dee has something to say already. Go right ahead. I had a head start. I was reading the question. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Jewelry making and creating had always just keeps my mind busy. I love it. Um, yeah, so to answer the question, yes, it has uh, it has allowed me to escape at these times. And um, like when I was talking earlier um, in my little presentation, um, last year, my business actually took a tremendous growth in 2020. Um, and I think it was due to the fact that previously I was always doing my, uh, selling my jewelry online on Instagram. So they were in stores previous to when it started. Um, so it didn't really affect my income too much as far as, far as sales goes. Um, and because I think I really start, used the opportunity to kind of change how I was running my business and started using different aspects of things that I offer, such as guided meditations, intention setting, teaching yoga, and just using it all as tools to help people actually helped with the growth as well. Pretty cool. Thank you, Dina. D. Cynthia's turn. I see Cynthia's hand raised. Hi. Um, yeah, as D said, like creating is so like helpful for your soul. Like I'm pretty sure anyone who creates can agree with that. Um, for me, well, I'm currently a student, so I just started getting into jewelry like two years ago. And with COVID, um, I ended up taking a gap year because some of the courses I wanted aren't being offered. And so I was kind of able to start on my business and like start exploring different ways of creating with jewelry. So I've been super fortunate to receive a bunch of commissions and sell some things that I hadn't been doing prior to this. So I feel very lucky for that. Good for you, Cynthia, thank you. All right, Kat is next. Um, with the COVID part, I just kind of wanted to talk on like the mental health component of it because jewelry making has always been um, a big part of my own self-care routine. And so I don't think I would be doing as well as I have mentally 
um, with COVID um, if I didn't have the jewelry making. So especially this time last year, I got to dive right into it and I went through really big creative spurts because I was home and I had to be home and I had actual dedicated time in my workspace to do that which was, was really good for me and my mindset. Um, and it really like being able to draw my culture and pull that into my work has been a really big thing. And I've turned to jewelry making, not just through COVID, but through other times as well to get me through tough times. So it has been, um, it's definitely helped cut my mind busy and help me not escape, but actually work through some healing. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, and thank you for for especially for touching on the mental health aspect of it, because that's something that people kind of want to push to the side on a normal day. But during COVID, we really do need to talk about that. So thank you for that answer. Um, no other hands raised from our panelists for this question I've noticed. So thank you, everyone, uh, for answering who answered. And um, OK, now we have a question from Heidi. Heidi wants to know, what is your biggest challenge as a local maker? Sorry, I was gonna say just not buying everyone else's work. Cause now like Cynthia, I want some rings. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia, or I, you know what, actually Cynthia is my cousin so I could get you the hookup. Don't you, don't you worry. <laughs> That's so kind of you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, do we do we have anyone who are we digesting the question or, or is it that we don't want to necessarily oh okay Cynthia yeah go ahead. Um, for me my biggest challenge is um, like I go to school out in Halifax so when I came back um, with COVID it was difficult because I didn't have access to facilities so I know for me like I had to kind of like start building my studio up and that's difficult to start out with when you don't have you know necessarily the funds or the proper equipment. Um, I think it's also um, perhaps like there aren't as many like local jewelry supply stores like you have to get a lot of stuff online whereas in Toronto you could like walk down the street and just pick up some materials that you need but all in all like no matter what like you can make the best with what you have you know and I wouldn't ask for any other place to be creating right now so thank you Cynthia that's really nice um anyone else have a, a hand that they want to raise or Mona or just, oh, okay sorry Mona I, then Jade I just wanted to say I've got to leave but thank you all for um this opportunity and it was nice meeting everybody and um I hope we get to see each other at an art show uh soon soon right uh, anybody doing art in the park it, who knows if that's even going to be a thing right at this yeah. point hopefully it will be we'll keep our fingers and toes crossed yeah. but yeah. um thank you for being with us thank here tonight mona um really appreciate your presentations and you're answering our questions and uh you're listening to everyone else's presentations as well take good care and uh yeah hopefully we'll see you soon at art in the park or another art show or just anywhere soon for sure okay bye-bye all right take care uh, thank you all, says uh, Esther Van Eek. Um, we can still, we, we have a few more questions if you want to keep going, um, but I understand if like Mona, you also have to take off. Um, and thank you, thank you, Esther, for coming. Um, oh, Esther has left, but that's, that's okay. So um, yeah, a few questions if we're okay to keep going still, but um, yeah, and not everyone finished answering Heidi's question. If we have anyone else who still wants to answer uh, the most difficult part of being a local maker, I think Jade was going to go next there. Um, I fully agree with Kat. I, I work shifts at the urban art market and have to refrain my or leave my wallet at home half the time. Um, but I think it was just because I didn't originally grow grow up here. I didn't know as much. Um, like I, I didn't have the um, the resources or the, I guess, uh, contacts to uh, know how to get into that the groups of people. But I just researched and went on Instagram, et cetera, and did um, questioning when I was at markets. I would question people in booths and stuff. But yeah, that was, I think, one of my biggest challenges is just finding um, out how to meet people and how to get into the, the local, um, um, 
you know, whatever, the, anything local. So that was my biggest thing, not, not being a local and trying to get into local, <laughs> so. The struggle is real. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jade. Um, Kat, Kat's got her hand raised again. Okay, no, I actually have a serious, more serious answer to this question, no. Serious <laughs> answer. So it was actually kind of drawing on what Cynthia was saying about resources. And so I talked about how like growing up in Toronto, I could get beats anywhere, any kind of material you're looking for, I will likely be able to find it there. And that has been a really big challenge with um, Windsor. And so since I've moved here, I had uh, access to different beat stores that have since closed because I've been here for, I've been in Windsor for 14 years now. Um, so I thought that this might be the perfect opportunity to share that I'm actually opening up a beat store. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Susan. Congratulations. Um, I don't know when, with the COVID restrictions and everything, in-person shopping for me is not um, a not, uh, not, uh, thing. But I saw that because I know the jewelry making in the city can be really challenging. And because I haven't been able to travel to Toronto to do that shopping, um, or even to go into Michigan, like all of, all of my normal uh, resources were gone. Um, and so shipping and all of those things have become kind of a, a burden to say in the past year. So I was like, I just need to do this. I had been wanting to do this since I was in school. And so I took the plunge and it will eventually be opening. So keep an eye out for that, everybody. That's my official announcement. This is the first time I've shared it with anyone publicly. So you're all the first to hear it. We are honored. Thank you, Kat, for sharing. I'm very excited for you. That's awesome. That's a great idea. I'm glad that you're that you uh, decided to announce it here. Thank you, and yeah, congratulations on that. Um, not many people are, are, you know, opening stuff in the middle of a pandemic. So more, even more kudos to you for that as well. No, it's gonna work out. It's okay. Don't facepalm. It's okay. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be amazing. It's a it's a pandemic proof business. So you're good. Um, do we have anyone else who wants to answer that question? Before we move on to the next one. Dee, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I don't think this is just for local, but um, I think for any artist, myself, anyways, um, I find that burning out, I have to be very cautious of that because I love my craft so much. I will just work, 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 work. So just really paying attention to um, how I'm feeling, listening to my body, my mindset, and just taking the rest that I need and just really uh, diving into my self-care so that I can continue to create. So that's one of the things that I find challenging sometimes is not overworking myself. That's an excellent point. Um, and that's, if you'll all indulge me later after we answer the audience questions, I have a question that relates to that answer that you just gave, that, that is purely my own and purely selfish in the asking. Um, the host is allowed to ask questions too. It's okay, it's a thing. Um, yeah, shall we move on to the next question or um, Laura, are you good? Or do you, did you wanna say something on that? Um. I guess so. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as you can probably tell, I'm a really awkward person. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess like a big challenge for me in like being a local creator is forcing myself into social situations in the real wild. Because <laughs> it takes a lot of, uh, takes a lot of energy from me to try and like calm myself down and and not like say things that don't make sense and <laughs> that kind of thing so um but I do like like even, even this is, is uncomfortable for me uh but I think it's important and I really want to network with people and I really want to connect with people and explore their art forms and support everybody like Kat said I just I just want to buy everybody's things <laughs> Like Christmas, my wallet took a beating, but <laughs> anyway, so for me, my biggest uh, challenge is just is just the social <laughs> uncomfortableness of being in in the in the social scene, <laughs> which you know, in COVID, I don't have to do much, so yeah, I've had a long a long break from that. <laughs> yeah, look on the bright side, right? <laughs> But yeah, I don't, I don't think you're awkward at all. I think that you are charming, but I totally get the, the social anxiety thing. Um, 
oftentimes when I'm speaking in public or, you know, saying anything at all, I'm turning bright red and just hoping that no one notices. Um, if you don't notice right now, it's only because of my foundation. But uh, I, I totally, I, I get that. I get that as well. Um, okay, so we have, now we're going back to um, uh, people who have already asked questions, but who had uh, more questions. So Michelle, again, for Cynthia, what was an item or medium you worked with that surprised you the most? Uh, meaning the outcome was something you never expected it to be. Probably the avocado pits, because um, originally I was just, I loved just like the spherical kind of form and I had planned on making it into like a weird chunky necklace. But then as I started like monitoring them as they dried out and gave them different drying conditions like humidity and lighting, I noticed that they would get these like beautiful organic patterns that kind of um, pop up the same way that like metal does when you're adding a patina and you're oxidizing it. And so um, it was kind of tricky to work with because I would have literally seconds um, to like coat them in um, like resins and um, Mod Podge so that they wouldn't continue to change color and so that I could preserve them. So yeah, definitely the avocado pits. They're so fun to work with. <laughs> Really cool, Cynthia, thank you. Um, we have another question from Dagan. There's been a big theme of spirituality throughout the talk and how much uh, and how much it's beneficial to all of your work. Are there ever times when spirituality has been a hindrance, difficulty or a negative to your work? Interesting question. I'm muted, sorry. I saw D first. So D, then Cynthia, then Laura. Um, I feel like it's never been. Um, my, if you go on my Instagram page, on my website, what you see is what you get. Um, so I feel like it's only really helped me to find like, I guess like my people, my, my customers. Um, and it's actually, yeah, never been a hindrance. It's just always benefited my business. And my creating too. Very nice, Tina. Thank you. Um, Cynthia. Yeah, no, it's never been something that challenges you in a negative way. It's actually what helps you continue to going, you know, it helps you find inspiration and keep faith in yourself, even outside of your work. You know, I feel that everyone has some sort of spirituality within them. And it's so important that you continue to like explore that and find out what it means to you so that you can work on living a healthy balanced life so thank you cynthia wise words good advice uh laura okay so i've got a, a yes and no answer for that <laughs> so on social media i i have had a lot of of negative experiences with people um i don't know how to delicately put this so it's gonna just come out blunt i guess but sort of sort of attacking my spirituality um so that's that's been negative for me um as well as uh, in the beginning of the the pandemic i don't know if you've experienced more um anxiety in the first but i did for sure. i think because there were so many unknowns that we were all navigating um, so I had to actually not offer customs in that shop because I just didn't feel spiritually prepared, right? Because the customs that come in, like you would be so surprised the personal connection that I form with these people and what they share with me um, and what we're praying together for, it's, it's really heavy. And if I don't feel like I'm in the, ment the right mental space to help them and to pray with them about it, I don't, I don't feel like I can, I can offer those customs to them. So I, I foregoed all of the custom um, for, for the beginning of the whole COVID experience. Now, having said that, I definitely leaned on my own spirituality, my own prayer to get through that time, right? And it's always been a part of my work. So uh, that's why there's the, the yes and no there. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for the very uh, open and honest answer. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, does anyone else have anything to say regarding? Oh, cat. Okay, I just saw it go up. Yes. 
Um, but oh, unmute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the um, I guess it, it ties together with the spirituality com component and what people will do to challenge my work. And because a lot of the things that I do are um, byproduct, animal byproducts, so leathers and birds and feathers, I have been challenged on that. Um, a lot of people that um, don't believe or support traditional practices of hunting in particular make that um, can make that a very difficult situation. And I know that I have enough skill and enough like strengthen myself now to have those conversations. But probably if you if you had if that had happened to me 10 years ago, I might not be in the same position that I am now. And it really wasn't that big of a conversation 10 years ago. But it is now. And there has to be an ethical way for me to source those materials, right? To meet for me to be working with leather, deer leather and moose leather and beaver fur and all of those things. And I understand that people don't want to support using furs and leathers. I, I get that. Um, but there is a traditional component to it. And so like, um, it doesn't necessarily always tie to spirituality, but there is a really important part of the respect that I have to give to those materials that I'm using. And that is a big part of my culture. Um, but when those difficult situations come up, it's a learning experience, right? And that's my opportunity. When I talk about wanting to share my culture, that's me being able to say, I know the hunter where I got this beaver fur from. And I don't always know exactly the hunters, but there are other people that I know that I contact that they say, hey, I um, got some meat and I have this leather for you. And I'm like, that's fantastic. And then there's, that's also how they sustain their families, right? Because they're selling their furs so that they can pay for them things themselves. And that's the sustainable kind of trade that we want in our communities, right? So I'm glad, Laura, that you said like that negative part because I didn't even think of it that way, but there is that, that, does, that doesn't come up as often, but it's always nice to have that conversation to educate others. Thank you, Kat. That's that's very important that you that you touched on all of that and uh, very well spoken and well explained on your part. So thank you very much for sharing that with us as well. Um, Jade, do you have anything to add in terms of the spirituality question or? Um, I guess with um mine i'm just really guided by energies in general um i didn't even know what that what it was i just thought i was almost bipolar when i was young because i was up and down so so much um but it's just it's energy i take on energies um from things all the time surrounding me and it it took a lot for me to um learn how to work with that and to um kind of be able to sometimes block it uh, or work with, especially because of my other job as well, um, massage therapy, where I'm taking people's energy inside all the time. Sometimes I would come home and just uh, crash because of what I was taking on. So that's kind of where I'm guided, I guess, is a lot of um, energy and how it uh, I'm drawn to it this way or that way. And sometimes it can be bad because I can be drawn in a bad direction or um, a lot of times it's good because I'm drawn in a wonderful direction. So I guess that's where it comes in with me. Follow the energy. Yep. Cool, thank you, Jade. Um, we have two more questions plus mine if we're, if we're willing to, but um, yeah. Okay, so second question from Dan. Dan wants to know how much time do you spend on your media marketing? Very practical question. can take some time to think. Okay, Cynthia, yes. Um, truthfully, I don't even like log the hours in which I spend on that because it kind of ties into your work as well. You know, like taking the time to document your work and showcase it and then edit all the photos and then upload it and then market it on top of that. So I feel like many people can probably agree with um, not spending enough time in terms of like, um, sharing their work in a way that it can reach like a vaster audience, but you also have to find that balance between life and work. So I probably like what I usually do, like I'll create a bunch of stuff over like two weeks and then I'll spend probably like about a week of just like photographing them and editing them. And I'll just kind of do like a little bit each day, so. 
Okay, well, that's that's good that you have your your process, at least. Even if you don't log everything, you seem to have a rhythm. So that sounds like it's good. Cat. My I simultaneously wanted to say I spend too much time and not enough. And I think we can all relate to that. Um, it, it With everything being virtual this past year, there has been a bigger push to try and get as much content up because people don't have the opportunity to see that in person, which is creating a big burnout for me, not just because, not because of the business, but because also my day job is all online now. Um, and it's, it's way too much. I'm too saturated. And um, when you try and set up those boundaries, customers don't always appreciate or respond to that. And it's, you just got to go with it. So right now I'm not dedicating a whole lot of time to it, but that's okay because I get to focus my energy on other things. Um, but I do want to answer that question because if you're actually looking to like build a business, you really need to um, get like schedule your time. You have to set that schedule because we all kind of, I think everyone is susceptible to kind of getting lost in the scrolling and looking through, you, you, throw, you go on Instagram and you want to do some posts, but you see some really cool stuff and then you kind of get lost in it. And if you don't actually set a schedule for when your posts are going to go up and how much time you're going to do to it and you're, and you're actually trying to brand yourself, um, you're going to get lost. And so this is why so many, there's so many branding companies um, and really Instagram savvy people that are doing well right now because they have, um, it's, a, it's a business right now, right? And so take advantage of that if that's not your skill, your strong skill set, because I know it's not mine because I get lost up in all of that. Um, but I would say at least a couple hours a week if your goal is to actually get yourself out there. Um, and there's a tool on Instagram where you can actually see how much time you've spent on it. So pay attention to that. And maybe I'll go and look down and see how much I spent last week. No, <laughs> but um, I, I try not, I've been, lately I've been really trying to minimize that just because of the burnout that is happening, so. Thank you, Kat, for the very thorough answer, very much. Um, and I see Laura has her hand raised as well. So Laura, go ahead. Yeah, so for me, I guess it kind of varies depending on what's going on. I typically only have a shop every couple months and like the week leading up to a shop, I am just like all over social media. Like I'm taking tons of pictures of all my products because I have to populate the website and they're all one of a kind, right? So I'm gonna have to redo all of that for the next shop. I don't get to like put one picture and set a quantity of like whatever, right? It's, there's only gonna be one. So it's very taxing um, as Kat said on your mental health sometimes and unfortunately, because we all depend on reaching out with social media and selling online right now, we don't have the luxury to turn off Instagram, you know, and I wish that we did. Um, you can set up self posts, you know, the auto post features, which I have been loving lately. Um, so there are times when I scale back quite a bit and just focus on creating and then I document and, and post it all the weeks leading up to a shop. So. Uh, I think it's more of a flow for me and finding finding balance and boundaries in my life, you know, because I also have kids at home. So, I mean, I don't want to be the mom that's, I mean, and no offense to any mom that's like that. That's great if that works for you and your kids, but mine are so young, I can't do that. <laughs> They're like pulling my hair, mom, mom. <laughs> so. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um. Yeah, does anyone else, I feel like I'm, when I say, does anyone else have any answers to this question, I'm like trying to force people to answer it, but I'm honestly not. I'm just wondering, like, if you didn't raise your hand, um, if you still wanted to say anything, but uh, if if not, if there are no elaborations, I can move on to the, the next question. Okay. All right, so the final question from the Q&A is, uh, this one is, this is a third from Michelle, and it's for Cynthia. Is there a medium you would like to work with that you haven't yet? Um, there are a few me ah, words, sorry. <laughs> there are a few mediums that I've been um, like, I've had like a little bit of exposure to that just made me hungry to work with them more. Um, I wish Mona was still here because like I've done a little bit of like lamp work, um, you know, glass beads and like small stuff like that. And it was such a like, cathartic um, process and it's definitely something I want to explore 
And lately I've just been having all these ideas in my head of like these concrete rings with like embedded crystals. And so I'm kind of like leaning towards concrete, but then I also need to learn how to make my own silicone molds so that I can work with the concrete. So that's kind of what I'm like exploring now. So like do it yourself, silicone molds and concrete and a little bit of lamp work eventually, once I have access to those kinds of facilities. I look forward to seeing that, Cynthia, especially like the concrete. That sounds so, I, I would never have thought to make jewelry with concrete. That sounds really cool. Thanks. Everyone has super surprised me tonight and I've loved everyone's answers. So I just have, um, if, if you'll indulge me, just one question of my own for everyone. Um, now, personally, maybe this is just because I spend most of my day sitting at a computer getting all like hunched over and cramped and, you know, just like needing to stretch and get up and that sort of thing. But um, the physical aspect of your making, is there ever a time when you're, you know, like you're, you're really like you're focused on your work, you're hunched over your work, but you're like physically exhausted, you want to get the project done, but you're just like the, your body is done. And um, so yeah, like, are there moments like that? And if so, how do you push through those moments to just get done what you need to get done? Laura, yes, thank you. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys noticed, but I'm like currently eight months pregnant. So um, <laughs> my body is slowly giving up on life. <laughs> More so now than my first two babies. So like, I've got like this weird arthritis all of a sudden and you know, like I got to pee every five seconds. So that's been really hard. My back is sore. Um, I'm not going to complain all night to you guys, although I could, <laughs> but if, even when I wasn't, when, wasn't pregnant, you know, sitting down and, and doing such intricate work for hours, it kind of makes your eyes burn after a while and your hands sort of cramps up. So um, that's been a, a bit of a challenge for me at times. So you just got to get up and stretch it out and, and, you know, uh, walk around and, and refresh yourself or, or take a break for a little bit. But, uh, for the most part, it's been pretty good the pregnancy and, and, you know, <laughs> and before. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Yeah, thank you for answering. I, I would have always thought like the one of the best things you can do is always just like get up and take a break. Um, and also, yeah, congratulations on your pregnancy as well. Um, I wish you all the best in the in the delivery and afterwards too. Uh, Cynthia, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Congratulations on your pregnancy. That's so exciting. I hope all the physical aches and stresses stop soon. Um, but yeah, like Laura said, it's just a matter of taking breaks frequently. Um, you know, for me, like I work with a lot of like metal and like bending it and filing it and like that's really taxing on my hands. So I know that if I spend like more than like a few hours a day, my hands will be shaking for the rest of the week. So it's really just kind of like recognizing your limits and not pushing them too much. Yeah, that's a good point because you're working with some really tough materials there. If I were you, I definitely would have like cut my hands all up and everything. They would have just <laughs> oh, been like, oh, that's my biggest fear. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, I know you have very deft, very skilled hands. So yeah, um, but that's that's a good point about like not taxing yourself to begin with. And like when you're done, done, you're done. Like not just when you need a break, but yeah, when you need to stop for the day, you got to know when that point is for yourself. So thank you. Um, anybody else want to talk about the physical aspect? Okay, I saw Kat and then Jade. Um, for me, I'm lucky. So I mentioned my family and like my mom and my sister, my grandmother at the top, like when she was doing it, but knowing for myself when I am kind of knowing my limits and when to ask for help because there's, especially if I'm doing repetitive or really big orders, um, there is, there is, we're susceptible to injury, right? And so sewing and working with materials and cutting and doing all that repetition um, is an invitation for trouble. If you don't take care of your body, and you don't recognize that. So asking for help has been a really big thing for myself, even if it's people that are not crafting, that I have friends that I'm like, hey, I need to cut out so many different patterns or I need to glue so many of these certain things and I would really appreciate, you know, some help. And I have been really lucky to have so many people who are willing to support me with that. 
Um, but it, it took me time to realize, to be able to do that, right? Because I have been jewelry making for so long. And that's one thing that I'm always encouraging others, like look to people who can help you. And if you have kids, I mean, you got little workers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's how I learned, right? Because my family was like, hey, you can help cut, you can do these things. And I learned these skills growing up and it totally influenced the way that I do things now. So um, taking your question about like the injury and taking breaks is just knowing knowing when to ask for help and kind of recognizing um, where you can, where, sorry, I said that I've lost myself. It's 8.30 at night now. I think I'm just tired, but anyways, just ask for help. I think that that's a big thing that sometimes we don't do. Yeah, a lot of us struggle with asking for help either because we feel bad. We don't want other people to feel put upon or we feel like it reflects on us, like we're weak somehow for asking for help or like a combination of those two things. So that is something we definitely need to get more accustomed to doing. Um, and people, for the most part, do like to help. So it's not something that we should be afraid to ask for. Um, OK, so Jade and then D. Um, I find that um, when I'm eating well, that helps my hands and everything too, because um, I'm staying away from inflammatory foods. Um, juicing helps me. My hands will stay a lot more limber and that makes it easy, even for my um, day job as well. Um, but there has been times where my brain's not thinking, I've been working all hours and um, I've glued my two fingers together so much that I couldn't get them apart and I had to cut them apart. Like it, you do crazy things when you're not, um, when you're not listening to your body. Right. So that was a, that was an interesting thing. I had a, a nice uh, scab on my hand for, I don't know, a good week with that one. So I try to listen. Now I pay attention. I'm, I learn quickly, especially with something like that. So yeah, I try to eat uh, with intention, obviously, and um, that keeps a lot of the inflammation in my hands down, which I find helps a lot. That's my main thing, I think, and listening to myself. <laughs> that's that's something I would never even thought of before, but that's that's an excellent point about how how eating can have an impact on on everything in your life to, in that way. And I was just thinking, like, if you drink too much coffee, you'll probably get the shakes, and that's not good for you either. So certain things to avoid, and not just certain things that you you definitely need to have but oh my gosh when you said like scab I was hoping like before you got to that part I was like please tell me she didn't cut skin like that was just that was a horror story <laughs> so thank you for the warning there um D please go ahead I can uh kind of ghetto what Jade said um besides running divine intention I'm also a yoga teacher and online wellness coach so I big part of that job is self-care, like I was talking about before. Um, I have over the years really built my body up through my yoga practice, lifting weights and staying very diligent to that. So that is like part of my work day. So in the mornings, um, I'll get up, I do my workout or my yoga and whatever. Um, and I feel that that's really helped to keep my body strong um, in order to work my other business. And just um, eating right, one of the things that I find um, for myself that I have trouble with is I don't drink enough water. So I just recently bought a big water bottle that's got the little notches on it. So that's been really helping me stay on track. Um, and just, you know, feeling my body properly with good food, yummy food, and just having stuff in the fridge that's ready and convenient. I can run upstairs from my studio and grab that. And yeah, just, just really uh, diving into self-care. Sorry, I just realized I started talking when I uh, had myself on mute there. But uh, yeah, th thank you for that answer as well. Uh, Self-care and then also staying hydrated. That's important no matter who you are. So yes, take that advice, everyone. Um, so yeah, that's all the questions we have for tonight. Thank you for staying extra late tonight to make this happen and to answer all the questions. Um, super grateful. And um, I know that a lot of people will be watching this after the fact as well, and will be grateful to have heard all your answers to these questions. Like I said, these get hundreds of views between YouTube and social media later on. So um, yeah, you'll see this up on YouTube and it's already up on Facebook, but you'll, you'll see it shortly. Um, and thank you all so much for everything. I'm gonna send all of you an email after this. Um, 
but yeah, uh, I, I think that's all for tonight then. Thank you for all of our attendees who are still here for slogging it out with us. Um, yeah, and thank a big thanks to everyone else um, to, you know, who, who came but who had to take off early. Thank you to Mona as well, who is not here anymore, but thank you for coming, Mona, if you happen to see this afterwards. Uh, Laura says, I'm gonna go look up anti-inflammatory foods. That sounds like a great idea, actually. That sounds like something we should all probably do. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just gonna wrap up the meeting now then. Um, if anyone wants to say any last words, any any final things, this is the chance. Yes, Cynthia. I just wanna thank you all for listening and thank everyone else who is presenting and thank you for organizing this. This is such a lovely night and this is such, I just feel so much love right now. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And it was my pleasure to organize it. All right, yeah. Thank you everyone then, um, if that's all for tonight. And uh, I hope that I get to see you and purchase all of your wares in person very soon, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hopefully, like Mona said, art in the park will be a thing. Um, and then, you know, and of course, other uh, things like urban art market. But um, in the meantime, stay well, take care. Thank you for everything. And um, like I said, I'm going to email you and feel free to reach out to me if you have any more questions or concerns about tonight or anything. And thank you once again to our attendees. Uh, lovely to meet all you, uh, lovely to meet all you lovely ladies, says Laura. Thank you, Laura. All right, everyone. Have a good night.